was laughing when I told my mother. There have been many cases throughout history, but especially throughout the past few decades, where children were put behind bars. Whether or not some of them have deserved it is widely debated, but there are a couple that very few debate. Some children are actually given life sentences while you spent the rest of your life in prison due to the unspeakable crimes that they have committed. And that's what this video is going to talk about today. Here are 15 times that life sentences were given to kids. Number 15, TJ Lane. TJ Lane was a teenager who gained notoriety in 2012 when he carried out a mass shooting at Chardon High School in Ohio. The shooting left three students dead and three others injured. Lane was just 17 years old at the time and had no prior criminal record. The shooting shocked the community and the nation, and Lane was quickly arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder. In 2013, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentence sparked a debate about the justice system's treatment of minors who commit violent crimes. Some argued that Lane, as a juvenile, should have been given a chance for rehabilitation and the possibility of parole. Others believed that the severity of his crimes warranted a life sentence. Lane's reaction to his sentence was one of defiance. In court, he wore a t-shirt with the word killer written on it and made obscene gestures at the family of his victims. He showed no remorse for his actions and even boasted about the shooting in a letter to a friend. The families of the victims were understandably devastated by the loss of their loved ones and the fact that Lane would never be held accountable for his actions. However, some also expressed sympathy for Lane's family and acknowledged the complexity of the situation. The case of TJ Lane highlights the difficult questions that arise when minors commit violent crimes. While there is no easy answer, it is clear that the justice system must carefully consider the circumstances of each case and strive to balance punishment with the potential for rehabilitation. That's that's not true. Number 14, Antonio Barbo and Nathan Papp. Antonio Barbo and Nathan Papp were two teenagers from Sheboygan, Wisconsin, who gained national attention in 2013 when they were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Papp's great-grandmother, Barbara Olson. The boys, who were both 14 years old at the time of the murder, had a troubled history. They had been friends since childhood, and both had a history of drug use and behavioral issues. On the day of the murder, they had reportedly been high on cough syrup and looking for money to buy more drugs. According to police, Barbo and Pap broke into Olson's home and beat her to death with a hammer and a hatchet. They then stole her car and other belongings and fled the scene. The murder shocked the community and the nation and the boys' sentencing to life in prison without the possibility of parole sparked a debate about the justice system's treatment of minors who commit violent crimes. Supporters of the boys argued that their age and troubled past should have been taken into account and that they deserved a second chance for rehabilitation. However, others believed that the severity of their crime warranted a life sentence. The judge who sentenced the boys noted that they had shown no remorse for their actions and that they posed a danger to society. Because of this, they were sentenced to life behind bars. Number 13, Donta Wright. Donta Wright's arrest and subsequent trial for the murder of Jordan Klee drew national attention due to him reportedly smirking and laughing during the court proceedings. Your why will never be better than his life. Your want will never trump my son's death. If you'll take a look at the clip currently on your screen, you'll see that he showed absolutely no remorse for the killing. The case was particularly heartbreaking for Klee's family members, who were in attendance throughout the trial. Klee, who was 18 years old at the time of his death, was working as a pizza delivery driver when he was fatally shot by Wright during an attempted robbery. Klee's death was a devastating loss for his loved ones, and it sparked outrage in the community. During the trial, Wright's behavior in the courtroom drew criticism and condemnation from many, who saw it as disrespectful to Klee's memory and to the justice system as a whole. Some argued that Wright's demeanor was a sign of a lack of remorse for his actions, while others suggested that it could be a coping mechanism in response to the gravity of the situation. In February of 2021, 
a jury found Wright guilty of second-degree murder and other charges related to the crime. He was sentenced to 25 to 52 decades in prison for his role in Klee's death. He won't be getting out anytime soon. However, nothing will benefit this child by sending her to jail. Number 12. Girl manipulated by boyfriend to kill her adopted family. Roxana Sikorsky was a teenager who was convicted of murdering her younger brother in 2014. According to reports, she had a troubled upbringing and had been adopted from a Polish orphanage along with her brother and sister. It was reported that she had been radicalized online and had developed extremist views. Sikorsky admitted to killing her brother and was planning to kill her sister as well, but was stopped by her parents before she could carry out the act. After fleeing the scene, she was later found and arrested by the police. During her trial, she was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The case of Roxana Sikorsky is a tragic reminder of the influence that extremist ideologies and online radicalization can have on vulnerable individuals. It also highlights the importance of mental health support and early intervention for at-risk youth. Roxana wasn't alone in her attempted murder, however. As one article puts it, manipulative boyfriend convinced his girlfriend to end her whole adoptive family. Her much older boyfriend, Michael Rivera, was attempting to get her to kill her family so she would run away with him. It's safe to say that things didn't go according to plan for the two murderous lovers. If you watch the clip on your screen now, you'll see that she teared up at the trial because she was led on by an older man and then lost everything she knew. Some people feel quite bad for her, while others still call her nothing but a stone-cold murderer. That's how I'm sorry. Number 11, Caleb Sharp, Freeman School. Caleb Sharp is a name that has gained notoriety in recent years due to his involvement in a tragic school shooting incident. On September 13th, 2017, Sharp, then a 15-year-old student at Freeman High School in Rockford, Washington, opened fire on his classmates, killing one student and injuring three others. The incident sent shockwaves through the community and the nation as a whole. Sharp was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and assault. He was tried as an adult and ultimately pleaded guilty to all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Since his conviction, Caleb Sharp has largely remained out of the public eye. He is currently incarcerated at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, where he will likely spend the rest of his life. The tragic events at Freeman High School have sparked debates about gun control and mental health resources for troubled students. While there is no doubt that Sharp's actions were horrific and caused irreparable harm to many people, there are also questions about what could have been done to prevent such a tragedy. Number 10, Brenda Spencer. Brenda Spencer is a name that is associated with one of the most tragic school shootings in American history. On January 29, 1979, Spencer, then 16 years old, opened fire on a group of children waiting outside Grover Cleveland Elementary School in San Diego, California, killing two people and injuring nine others. When police arrived at Spencer's home, where she had been shooting from, she famously replied to the question of why she had done it with the words, I don't like Mondays. This livens up the day. This statement became the inspiration for the hit song, I Don't Like Mondays by the Boomtown Rats. Spencer was arrested and charged with murder and assault with a deadly weapon. At her trial, she pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. She has been denied parole multiple times and remains incarcerated. The case of Brenda Spencer has sparked debates about the causes of school shootings and the treatment of mental illness. Spencer had a troubled childhood and reportedly been the victim of physical and sexual abuse. She had also been diagnosed with depression and had a history of drug use. While these factors do not excuse her actions, they do provide important context for understanding the tragedy. In the years since the shooting, there have been numerous efforts to improve mental health resources for young people and to prevent gun violence. Number 9. Youngest person executed in 20th century U.S. was wrongfully convicted. The case of George Stinney is one of the most infamous examples of racial injustice in American history. In 1944, Stinney, 
a 14-year-old African-American boy, was accused of murdering two white girls in Alkaloo, South Carolina. Despite the lack of evidence and a coerced confession, Stinney was quickly tried, convicted, and sentenced to death by electric chair. The trial lasted just one day, and Stinney's appointed defense attorney did little to defend him. The all-white jury took just 10 minutes to reach a guilty verdict. Stinney was executed just 83 days after his arrest, making him the youngest person ever executed in the United States in the 20th century. For decades, Stinney's case received little attention or scrutiny, but in recent years, there has been a renewed interest in seeking justice for him. In 2014, a South Carolina judge vacated Stinney's conviction, citing lack of due process and constitutional rights violations. That clip can be seen on your screen now. The case of George Stinney has become a symbol of the systemic racism and injustice that has plagued the American criminal justice system for centuries. It is a reminder that the legal system is not always fair or impartial and that innocent people can be caught up in a web of racism, poverty, and political expediency. And I'm sorry, you know. Number eight, boy who killed his neighbor out of fear of father. Joshua Phillips is a name that is associated with one of the most shocking cases of child-on-child -child violence in recent memory. In 1998, when he was just 14 years old, Phillips murdered his eight-year-old neighbor, Maddie Clifton, in Jacksonville, Florida. Phillips initially claimed that Maddie had been killed by an intruder, but when her body was found hidden beneath his waterbed, he eventually admitted to the crime. He had struck her with a baseball bat and then stabbed her multiple times with a knife. Phillips was tried as an adult and convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. His case has since become a subject of intense debate with many arguing that he should have been tried as a juvenile and given a chance at rehabilitation. I'm sorry, you know, and, that, uh, and also that, uh, that I'm trying. Despite the severity of his crime, some have also pointed out that Philip was a troubled young man with a history of neglect and abuse. In the years since conviction, there have been calls for more resources to be devoted to preventing child abuse and addressing the root causes of violent behavior in young people. The case of Joshua Phillips serves as a sobering reminder of the devastating impact that violence can have on a community. It also highlights the complexities of dealing with juvenile offenders and the need for a more nuanced approach to justice and rehabilitation. Number 7. Nicholas Cruz Nicholas Cruz is a name that has been associated with one of the deadliest school shootings in American history. On February 14, 2018, Cruz entered Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and opened fire, killing 17 people and injuring 17 others. Cruz was a troubled individual who had a history of behavioral issues and was known to law enforcement agencies. He had been expelled from the high school the previous year for disciplinary reasons and had a long history of violent and erratic behavior. In the aftermath of the shooting, there was a widespread debate about gun control laws in the United States, with many people calling for stricter regulations on firearms. Cruz's ability to obtain a weapon despite his history of violence and mental health issues was a major point of concern. The shooting also sparked a national conversation about mental health and the need for better resources to help individuals who are struggling with mental illness. Many people questioned whether the tragedy could have been prevented if Cruz had received the help he needed. Cruz was eventually arrested and charged with 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Parkland shooting was a tragic event that left an indelible mark on the American psyche. It served as a wake-up call for many people, highlighting the need for greater attention to issues such as gun control and mental health. As a society, we must continue to work towards creating a safer and more compassionate world for all people. Like Number 6. Conrad Schaefer Conrad Schaefer was a teenager who was involved in a crime spree in Osceola County, Florida in 2013. Along with a group of friends, Schaefer was responsible for a series of burglaries, robberies, and violent crimes, including the murder of two teenagers. 
The first victim was David Guerrero, who was fatally shot by Schaefer during a robbery at a convenience store in Point Siena. The second victim was Eric Rupnarine, who was attacked and killed in his own home by Schaefer and his friends. Rupnarine was reportedly shot and had his throat slit during the attack. Schaefer was ultimately arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder, along with other charges related to the crime spree. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The case of Conrad Schaefer is a tragic example of the devastating impact that youth violence and criminal behavior can have on communities. It is also a reminder of the importance of early intervention and prevention programs to help at-risk youth before they become involved in dangerous and destructive activities. Before we go on, like this video, smash that subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face while you're sleeping. It's time for today's subscriber pick. This image showcases two children under the age of 18 who were sentenced to life in prison. Both of them committed egregious acts, including murder, which led to their sentencing. In fact, the boy on the right is someone that we've already spoken about within this video. Conrad Schaefer. It's no secret that imprisoning young children for the rest of their life is a contentious topic, but many believe that if someone is so violent from a young age, they will never be able to grow out of it. What do you think? Do you believe children should be imprisoned for life if they murder somebody? Or do you think there should be some system of leniency? Remember to comment down below with the hashtag, hashtag subscriber pick, and let us know what you think. Now on to the next topic. Sentence him to nine years in Florida State Prison. Number five. Bayshore Street Racing. Cameron Heron made headlines in 2018 when he was charged with vehicular homicide after a car he was driving struck and killed a mother and her 21-month-old daughter in Tampa, Florida. According to police reports, Heron was driving his car at a high speed on a residential street when he lost control and struck the victims, who were walking on the sidewalk. The impact of the collision was so severe that both the mother and daughter died at the scene. Heron, who was just 18 years old at the time of the crash, was arrested and charged with two counts of vehicular homicide. During his trial, prosecutors argued that Heron was racing with his friend, John Baranu, and that their reckless driving was a contributing factor in the deaths of the victims. In 2021, Heron was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to 24 years in prison. His friend, John Baranu, was also convicted and sentenced to nine years in prison. Heron did attempt to get his sentence reduced, but as one article states, a judge declines to reduce 24-year sentence for Cameron Heron in Bayshore crash case. Whether or not that will change remains to be seen. I'm sorry that this happened. Number four, Austin Myers. Austin Myers gained notoriety for his involvement in a gruesome murder that shocked a small Ohio community in 2014. Myers was just 19 years old at the time of the crime, which involved the brutal killing of 18-year-old Justin Back. According to court records, Myers and his accomplice, Timothy Mosley, lured Back to a home under the guise of buying drugs. Once there, they attacked him with a knife and a hammer then dismembered his body and attempted to dispose of the remains. Myers was arrested shortly after the murder and charged with aggravated murder, kidnapping, and aggravated burglary. At his trial, he pleaded not guilty, claiming that Mosley had acted alone in the killing. However, DNA evidence and testimony from Mosley contradicted his story, and Myers was ultimately convicted of all charges. The clip currently on your screen showcases Justin's father talking to the murderer of his son at court, expressing hatred, and nobody can blame him. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you how much I hate you. In 2018, Myers was sentenced to death for his role in the murder. His accomplice, Timothy Mosley, was also convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The case of Austin Myers is a tragic example of the extreme consequences of violent crime. It also highlights the importance of swift and effective justice for victims and their families. I am sorry. Number three, homeschooled teen Nehemia Griego. Nehemia Griego is a young man who gained notoriety for committing a heinous crime at the age of 15. On January 19, 2013, Griego shot and killed his parents and three siblings in their home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Griego had a history of mental health issues and was reportedly influenced by violent video games and movies. 
He also allegedly idolized mass shooters and had a fascination with firearms. After the murders, Griego called a friend, who then contacted authorities. Griego was apprehended without incident and confessed to the killings. He was charged as an adult with five counts of murder and three counts of child abuse, resulting in death. During his trial, Griego's defense argued that he had been severely abused and neglected by his parents, and that he was not in his right mind when he committed the murders. However, the prosecution maintained that Griego was fully aware of his actions and had planned the killings for weeks. In 2016, Griego pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. He will be eligible for parole in 2043. Number 2. Zachary Davis Zachary Davis is a name that has become synonymous with one of the most heinous acts of violence in recent memory. In 2015, when he was just 15 years old, Davis murdered his mother and younger brother at their home in Elkhart, Indiana. Davis used a sledgehammer to attack his mother and brother in their sleep, killing them both. He then fled the scene and was apprehended several hours later by police. He was charged with two counts of murder and pleaded guilty to both charges. Davis was sentenced to 140 years in prison, with no possibility of parole. His case has since been cited as an example of the complex and devastating impact of mental illness on young people. It is unfortunately quite similar to many of the other cases we have spoken about today, because mental illness tends to be the norm in these kinds of situations. That is not to stigmatize it. No, instead we should work with people who are suffering to ensure that things like this don't happen. While there is no question that Davis committed a horrific crime, some have of course pointed out that he was struggling with severe mental health issues at the time of the murders. In the years since the conviction, there have been calls for more resources to be devoted to addressing mental illness and preventing similar tragedies from occurring. Number 1. Rising Star in Saline Samantha Grigg was a teenager from Saline, Michigan, who was involved in the murder of Michigan State University student Dustin Frolka in February of 2014. Grigg and two other men, Brendan Heim and Tyrell Bredernitz, lured Frolka into their vehicle with the promise of drugs and money, and then proceeded to beat him severely while driving. Frolka was left on the side of the road with severe injuries and later died in the hospital. Grigg was arrested and charged with first-degree murder along with the two other men. During the trial, Grigg claimed that she was under the influence of drugs and alcohol at the time of the murder and that she did not actively participate in the beating of Frolka. However, the prosecution argued that she was a willing participant in the crime and was just as responsible for Frolka's death as the other two defendants. Grigg ultimately pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to between 20 and 50 years in prison. Heim and Bredernitz were also convicted of first-degree murder and received life sentences. She has attempted to take it all back, of course. As one article puts it, Celine teenager sentenced to prison for MSU student's death. I wish I could take it back every day. There are some that believe that she should have been tried less harshly, but others are adamant about the fact that you taking a life warrants life. It's up to you whether you agree or not. Thanks so much for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next one.